Hi everyone, we're doing module eight today, following care procedures and on uh, addition 11, it starts on page 69. And there's your need to know words and objectives written on that page. Um, and I will, there's so many words, I want you to come back and go over these after we lecture through the chapter to see if you remember what they are. Objectives are um, how we're gonna measure intake and output, uh, collect specimens like urine and feces, describe special care for procedures, special care for residents with tubing of some kind, uh, demonstrate proper application of bandages. We're gonna talk about, but not really do, and talk about bed making. Um, one of the first things though is the word procedures. When we're in, um, in the title, when we're in, Doing tasks in healthcare, they're uh, nursing tasks. They're usually called procedures that we do. Um, so, what what procedure did you do? You got the person out of bed. You transferred them to the wheelchair. That would be considered a procedure. Okay. Um, first, we're talk about intake and output. So, uh, what goes in, if fluid wise, just fluid, is called intake and any fluid that comes out of a person's body is output. So um, intake is usually what we drink and output is usually what we urinate, right? Those are the two main ones. However, intake could also be if someone was in a hospital and they were getting IV fluid or blood in through an intravenous line, that would be intake. We're not gonna do that now, but just so you know, they use that in the hospital. Output is, is urine, but there may be other outputs. If someone has liquidy diarrhea stool, it counts as output. If someone has a drainage bag that's draining blood or some kind of fluid out of the body, that is output. Okay. Uh, fluids that go in and fluids that go out. So how much will, how much should we take in and fluid wise? So generally we'll take in um, the literature will say uh, about eight glasses of eight fluid ounces is, is normal for most people. So about 64 ounces. And if you convert that, multiply it by 30 uh, cc's equal an ounce, that's 920 milliliters or about two liters. So think of liter water bottles. Um, however, you know, how, what your health is, how big you are, how small you are, how much you're sweating, how much you're using a lot of fluids. Um, also the food we eat, which aren't even on here, if you're in a lot of like a watermelon, fr uh, fruit, uh, uh, liquidy fr fruit, like strawberries and cherries and, and vegetables that are um, like cucumbers, that has fluid in it too. So um, it, it depends on a lot of different things. But. So let's calculate how we're going to do this. So um, how much did you drink yesterday? What do you think you drank? So just try to think of that. So each water bottle, a normal water bottle is 500 cc's. The normal cup that we use, and I don't have any here, glass, is 240 cc's. Um, and uh, a big coffee cup is 240, or a regular coffee cup is 240 cc's. Um, so, but even a grande uh, coffee, which from Starbucks, 416 ounces, 480 mil, and the Vente is 600 mil. So, and then the other way we measure output is we could add it up if 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 we're urinating in a bedpan or in, in a, a container that will catch it. However, one other thing that you're gonna look at is how, how many times did someone urinate or did you have to change their brief, right? So we do that same with younger, with babies, right? Oh, I'm changing their diaper and, and they're, they're not wetting it. Well, then they're dehydrated. They don't have enough fluids. Same thing with older people. If they're incontinent, but they don't need to be changed often, then um, um, they didn't urinate enough, right? So there's two things with urine. It's the amount and then how often. So how often 
if you're going too often, that often means a urinary tract infection, but you're not urinating much out because really that, that need to urinate is caused by spasms of the bladder, right? It's not because the bladder's full of urine. So more important is how much did you urinate, but also each time how much was it? That's something sometimes we, look, we often look at in the hospitals. Okay, so fluid um, intake and output. How do bodies lose fluid? Well, we already said urinating, but there's other ways. You're breathing, you, you have fluid in your mouth and you lo lose fluid there. Um, urination, we said perspiring. And bowel movements, more if it's liquid diarrhea. Okay, so, um, and of course our bodies need a daily supply of, of fluid. Water is the best, but also those, remember, vegetables that contain fluid or like soups and things like that, beverages. Okay, so some words to, that you need to know. Dehydration, loss of too much fluid. Um, edema is when the body retains too much fluid, so we swell up. And both have serious health problems. Um, your kidneys like to have a lot of fluid running through them, so if you're dehydrated too long, you could cause kidney damage. Okay, so when does dehydration occur? It occurs when the body loses more fluid than it takes in, right? So maybe you're just not drinking and that's why you're dehydrated. Um, the, or the body is unable to function, um, or it could be from f severe fluid loss. Two, so you're in a car accident, you start bleeding out, right? That's blood is fluid. So then you don't have enough fluid. Um, and just know the body needs adequate fluids to function properly. So warning signs of dehydration, thirsty or just a dry, sticky mouth. Some, and older people often don't feel thirst, but you could just tell the way they're moving their mouth. Um, Dark urine it means it's more concentrated. If someone is dizzy, faint, um, their heart rate may be up. Um, you can get muscle cramps or weakness. Definitely constipation because that's what the large intestines does. It tries to suck all the water back into the body, makes the stool or poop as hard as a rock, and so um, they get constipated. Of course, less frequent urination, you're not urinating, and then dry skin, lack of, lack of skin elasticity, and I'll show you a picture of that, um, dry mouth, fatigue, headaches, light, lightheadedness, or confusion. And here is a picture of like, see how that skin just stays up after they pinch it? That's because they um, are dehydrated. Okay. Um, so who's more at risk? The elderly are at a high risk. They don't feel as thirsty as younger people do. Um, so one of the things as a caregiver, really, with unless for some reason they have restricted fluids, um, the doctor doesn't want them to drink. So maybe if they're towards um, with certain conditions, but for the most part, you want to keep fresh water near reach. Offer it to them a lot, okay? Um, and then there's other foods, juices, popsicles, mm, uh, ice cream, not the healthiest. However, I love those fruits, watermelon, grapes. They are, they have fluid in them and they are nutritionally good for you. Uh, okay. So edema is too much fluid in the tissue and it could be, be painful when it swells up. The main causes for edema conditions are heart disease and kidney disease, okay? And some people could be affected by too much salt that could cause their swelling to be more. Uh, more. And most it mostly affects the feet, the ankles, and the legs because they're in a dependent, they're down, gravity brings it down. However, it could affect any part of the body. So here's the person with swollen. This hand is swollen compared to this one. And these legs are both swollen. Um, when someone has edema, try to encourage those clients to wear loose-fitting clothing. It'll be more comfortable for them. 
raise swollen limbs, so their hands or their legs above heart level. Now, obviously, your foot can't be above your heart level all the time because you're walking and sitting. However, when they get in a bed or on a couch, if you could prop them up on a pillow, that will help with the swelling or usually helps. When people have edema, the, they may have a doctor's order to re, um, regarding the fluids. One could be just restrict the fluids. So they might say only take 1,000 milliliters a day. Um, and so then you have to measure that, right? Four, so that would be about four glasses of fluid um, because they were 250 cc's each. But you could actually, if you're in someone's home, you could take out a measuring device. Another one might be, not for the edema, but for dehydration, is to force fluids. And that means, you know, force it down their throat, but you um, kind of keep giving them fluids every time. Encourage them to drink fluids, take popsicles. Uh, and, and the other one would be uh, nothing by mouth. So at, sometimes people, the doctor says, don't have anything by mouth. It's generally for a test. However, there could be things going on where they don't want them to drink any fluid for a while. And so we may be requested to measure that intake and output to help mon monitor that resident or client's health. Okay. Uh, right now I'm on at page 70 in your book if you have the 11th edition. And so when we're measuring things, when we're measuring fluids, Remember that any food that turns to liquid at room temperature, like ice cream and even gelatin, even though it stays consistent and custard, things that melt will be considered um, fluids. Um, and if, if someone has a pitcher of water, don't forget to include that. Um, include the coffee, tea, juice. Um, and our conversion that we do should know is one ounce e equals 30 cc's. Although in um, skilled, you will need to know that for CNA, but in um, assisted living and uh, at for home, you probably won't, will not need to know that. Okay. Um, Okay, so to be able to know how much they drink, you have to know was the cup full when you served it. Um, so you have to know the amount of fluid that you served to begin with, or was the pitcher full when you brought it out. Um, and then there are just like you have in the kitchen, there are measuring devices and you can always use those. And I'll, we have pictures later, I'll show you. Um, Measuring output includes urine, water restore, only water restore, blood loss, vomit, that's another one, um, any kind of wound drainage, perspiration, but mostly we're looking at urine and sometimes vomit or water restore. Um, and so uh, the urine is usually the, the one that we look at the most, but we combine them all, right? So, uh, especially for older adults and children, if they have constant, if they're having watery diarrhea, they are losing a lot of fluid. So we add that to the urine, urine output. So you always combine them all. Okay. Um, okay, if we are trying to measure urine, this little thing's called a hat, and on it, it goes in a toilet, um, and you put the hood of the toilet down, and it will hold it, the, the cover, and then the person could urinate into this, and you could see that it's measurements, and uh, cc's on one side are milliliters, and on the other, ounces. So that's one way you catch the urine. If it's a male, you could catch the urine in, in a urinal, and if it's a female, you could catch it in a bedpan, too. Um, but generally, if they can ambulate, you want them to, you want to use this on the bathroom. Um, and then you're going to measure in, if you have to do this, measure in a graduated cylinder. Now for CNA, we have to do that for this class. You probably won't, but you know, as soon as you say that, you have to do it. But I want to give you an idea. So here, I drew this in and didn't go very good. But over here, we're looking at the CC. So that would be 400 CCs of urine. 
And most of these things are in 25 cc increments. So um, if you go from the bottom, that's 25, 50, 75, 100. And then um, in B, what well, this one is not very straight across. Your is usually not like that, but it goes, it's between 3 and 325 right here. Okay, and if you're looking at a urinal, they're already marked. And again, they're in 25 cc increments. So if that's 700 there, it's a little hard to see between 725 and 750. You don't have to be exact. Pick 725 or 750 if you're measuring urine output. Okay, the other thing you might have to do is collect specimens. A urine is the most common specimen to be collected. This is not for urine. This is for stool. That's another one. And then they send it to the lab. Now, even if you're working in a home, sometimes they'll ask you to get a urine specimen and then bring it in because your client might not be able to go in. Make sure you've got the right name and date on it, full name, and if they have a medical record number. Um, this one is, is a little shovel tiny too just for stool specimens they don't need a lot of specimen to do their research in the lab okay there's different kind of urine specimens um, the routine you could do it right in a bed pan the best specimens if they have a urinary tract is to try to clean the uh, area from front to back the the woman's uh, peri area and the man just like we clean it around and that usually comes in a container with cleaners but you could always clean before you use that and then if you could if the person could go to the bathroom a little bit urinate a little bit stop then get the specimen it's the best specimen you will not be doing 24-hour specimens at home so next let's go into the different uh, tubes that may people may have and even at home oxygen is a tube that is frequently used right so it needs an order by a doctor we're not the personal care assistant is not supposed to make changes to the volume to how fast it's coming out um and remember oxygen is a medication because if you get too much it could actually make people worse sometimes um, people's mouth, um, mouth and nose may get dry, so we try to keep it moistened with a lot of fluid and even, um, you know, lotions under the nose. Okay. The big thing with, um, O2 is that you have to observe, um, safety rules and a big safety with oxygen use is no smoking, right? It could spark and really is very combustible, meaning that it will just start a big fire. So no smoking around that. And no electrical, anything electrical that could spark. Okay. Um, the other type of tubing we may have are urinary catheters. So this is a tube, and let me show you a picture. A tube that goes, here we go with the mail again, up the penis, but it could also go into the, the urethra, right? There's still the same tube here, urethra. And it goes up into, this is the bladder. So it collects at the end of this, there's little holes that collects the urine, comes down and it goes, this man is wearing a leg bag, but there's also different containers that hang on a bed. So um, because the, this area has to be kept clean because bacteria love to travel up any kind of tube, so you have a higher incidence of infection. Um, always, if there's any problems, report it to your agency uh, or your who's ever in charge, leaking, skin irritation, pain. And as far as working with that patient, always keep that drainage bladder below the level of the resident's bladder. So the bag sorry, has to be lower, the bag lower than the bladder, because if you raise this bag up, that urine that's in the bag will go back in, and it's considered contaminated once it comes out. Okay, and here's a picture of it in the, in the, in the lady. So as you can see, 
um, although that's not a very good picture, it doesn't look like there's any urethra here, um, there is a little balloon in there, and that's what helps keep that tube in, so you don't want to make tug on it. Um, once it goes in, they blow up a balloon. It's literally a balloon to keep it in. And here it is if someone's in bed, again, hanging on the bed, keeping it below the level of the bladder. So if someone has a, a, a urinary catheter in, we have to definitely clean around the catheter. So we're cleaning the catheter itself besides doing regular peri care. So with, and you could use regular soap and water. This is where you want to have clean washcloths though. You could also use wipes, but you want to clean, hold on, well, with your gloved hand, hold on as close as you can to that insertion site, and then wipe down. So always going away, then change the cloth around, and then go down again. But you want to hold it. You don't want to tug from it, because it'll tug the inside. Okay, and do it as many times as you have to, but using a different part of the, the, um, the uh, washcloth. And then you also want to use another washcloth to clean around the pericare just as you did before. Okay, in your book on page 75 are, is the whole step by step, but I want to emphasize again, hold the catheter near the meatus. That's the opening to avoid tugging on the catheter. And you're going to gently clean and rinse at least four inches of the catheter. But you could, catheter's dirty, do the whole thing. Um, because you, but you want to at least do when you're doing peri care four inches down. Okay. Um, and clean away from that meatus going down. Um, and that you could read that in your book. It's just, uh, doing the procedure. Apply bandages. We generally don't apply bandages. The nurse does that. Um, even in assisted living and at the home. So um, um, ask your agency. Um, we do put on dressings, though, sometimes to protect. Um, if it's an open area, we're not supposed to be putting on any bandages, but sometimes we put, thing, put on bandages or gauze to prevent the skin from opening up. Um, and the last is about making bread. So some things you might not think of that with, from home, um, but when you're working with clients and they're in the bed a lot, make sure you, when you fold up the uh, bedding for dirty things that there's no valuables in it, like dentures have gotten thrown out, or you know their clothing, or you know if they're holding a rosary or something like that. And then um, make sure you roll up the soiled linen away from your body. Um, we'll sh there's there's videos of changing beds, but um, you, when we change a bed with someone not in it, it's called changing an unoccupied bed. And generally, really, um, they use fitted sheets on the bottom, um, and there's a video of how to make a miter corner for the top sheet. Makes it look good. My opinion, I can't stand when I'm in a bed and I have a miter corner sheet and it's all tucked in. I, they do that in the hotels too. It's too tight on my feet. So if you're doing it to look nice during the day, when someone gets in, see if they want that loosened up. Um, okay. And then if you make a, um, a bed with someone in it, that's just like we're going to change the, the one, uh, like a lift sheet. We're going to move them from side to side. We're going to change the whole bottom on one side and then roll them over on the clean sheet and, and change the other side. And there's videos in, in this, um, in this uh, module. So, but when you end up, you want to make sure that, um, that you pull the linen tight and there's not wrinkles in it. Because if the someone's in it all the time, it gets uncomfortable for them. Okay, and here... Uh, the last thing, it, remember I said to make sure that there's room in the toes. If you don't take out the whole sheets, although I don't like the miter corners and take the whole thing out for me, I'd rather have my 
covers the land on the floor because it's just too tight for me. But you could also make a toe pleat, um, and they'll show you in the video how to do that, which just kind of you bunch up. This was the end of the bed. I was making a toe pleat. I would just pull this. Oh, I don't know if it's this. And that is it for this module. Hey.